Hey everybody, welcome to our conversation today with Megan and I, and we're so excited to have you here. If you are a Scottsdale family, we love you. Um, if this has been shared outside of our Scottsdale family, we're super excited to just share what God has been teaching us and showing us in our ministry, um, and we hope that it's a, a huge encouragement to you. So to introduce ourselves first, my name is Ryan Lambert. Uh, I'm the children's pastor here at Scottsdale Baptist Church. Um, I've been a part of Scottsdale for about 12 years and I've been on staff for seven. So I've had a, a good amount of time um, being with kids, kind of learning the ropes around here. Um, I am married to my wife, Summer. We've been married for eight years this year, so that's really exciting. Um, and for those of you that don't know me, I am Megan Hayes. I'm the children's ministry director. Ron and I work really closely together uh, to serve the body here um, in the children's ministry. Um, I have been on staff for three and a half years, um, and I came out of public education as a PE teacher, uh, which is so fun. I love activity. Um, I'm married to my husband. We've been married for 10 years, and we have two boys, an eight-year-old and a recent six-year-old. He's six years old last week. Woo! Happy birthday. And I think that you have a fun fact mm -hmm. that not a lot of people know. Yeah. I was racking my brain a little bit, but when I found this, I was like, this is it. Mm -hmm. So my fun fact is that I was named after my Japanese uncle. You have a Japanese uncle. Sure do. Mm. Yep, my Japanese uncle named Ryan. Okay. That's who I'm named after. Okay. Um, so it's kind of a surprise to people, but my favorite thing that's ever happened with that is that a friend actually asked me, but you don't look Japanese, to which I said, I'm not. It's by marriage. <laughs> so it was a really funny moment. That's a fun story. How about yours? I also had a really hard time because I like to consider myself a very transparent person. Yes, so you are. I my fun fact is that I used to want to be a meteorologist. Yes. As a child, I was, and even to this day, I still love weather. Mm -hmm. I love the hype that comes behind a impending doom storm, which is so strange. But everybody Ooh. starts like kind of panicking and, yep. and collecting things. So like when COVID came, it was a, it wasn't weather, but it was mm -hmm. like, let me see what I can get. Let me see what I can get. And everyone yeah. was just so jazzed all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just the unpredictability of it, it's just kind of fascinating to me. Yeah, you thrive in chaos. It's kind of like I do. I, that's yeah. a compliment. Yeah, it's a good thing to have on yeah, a church staff. Yeah, 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 for yeah. sure. Um, well, I just did want to introduce ourselves in front of people who may not know us, but also wanted to speak to anyone who's watching this, um, our purpose and mm -hmm. what we're trying to do here, because this is not something we've done a lot of. We hope to maybe be doing more of this in the future, whether um, in this uh, venue of online or whether it's in person. But really our desire, and we've said this over and over, is to encourage, empower, and equip parents. And that is in every season. And something we've said is that a true children's ministry is really a family ministry at its core. And in that we recognize a parent's monumental role in discipling their kids. Mm, yeah. And I think as we've walked through different seasons with different parents and families, um, I think one of the things that's most daunting for families is this idea of a child's lostness. Um, I think it's obviously the greatest desire, and you could speak to this and you will, as far as being a parent right now, but the idea that their child is lost is so hard for parents, mm -hmm. I think, to grasp and to receive. And sometimes that even causes a lack of discernment mm -hmm. about where a child is at um, in certain seasons. And so that's what I've noticed is that there's maybe this hope that families have, but there's not a great way to understand, mm, let me be really uh, discerning about these faith steps that a child is taking. And so. would you agree that you think a lot of that confusion or lack of discernment or maybe even misconceptions or misunderstandings is probably due to our experiences as children ourselves? Mm. Yeah, yeah. It made me, it's really made me reflect on my own transformation story, you know, my own testimony of coming to the Lord. Um, which is similar to many that I hear in this church. Mm -hmm. And that is that I grew up in a Christian home. And I'm grateful for that fact. I think my parents did their best to raise me. My dad grew up in a Catholic background, my mom in a Methodist. So my upbringing was very works driven and very appearance, very external. Um, but I do admit that God began a work early in my life as a child. I desired to go to church. I desired to learn the things of God. I desired to read the Bible. I had an affection for the Bible. 
Um, and when I was 10 years old, I went to a, a church camp with my friends and, you know, at the emotional time as it usually happens mm -hmm. when the music is playing and you're asked to give your life to Jesus. Um, I walked down that aisle as a 10 year old, probably bawling my eyes out. Um, and I received Christ that night mm -hmm. and I professed him and I was even baptized several weeks later as a 10 year old. Um, but what I noticed is through middle school and high school, that affection kind of tapered off and I didn't have that desire. It wasn't the main thing in my life. Um, and it wasn't until I went to college and I was out of the comfort zone of home and I was in a different space and I did, I wasn't, my hand wasn't being held, you know, by different people when I realized, wow, like the Lord isn't my full life. Like I've chosen other things above him. And so it took till I was 18 to really grasp and really commit my life to the Lord. And so I think, you know, that's my story. So I, I see that at work in the lives of many children and teens that they're kind of in that same boat almost. Yeah, we're, uh, you and I are a similar age. Uh, we're just a couple years apart. And my experience was a little similar um, where mine was my cousin, I had noticed he was a couple years older than me. I had, I don't even remember how old I was. I had to have been close to 10, maybe eight to 10. And I remember he walked down the infamous aisle mm. and I noticed all the attention that he received um, for professing faith and, and taking that next step. And I remember sitting back in the pew and thinking, well, golly, like that probably feels really good to have everybody yeah. go and shake your hand and, and give you all this attention. And I was like, well, I've been going to church. I come every mm -hmm. Sunday. I come every Wednesday night. This is the obvious next step for me. Um, so it was a couple weeks later, I did the same thing. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't remember much about what happened between walking down and professing faith publicly and what happened between that and the time I was baptized. It was mm -hmm. very fast. I do remember that. Yeah. There might have been a book we read. There might have, but there wasn't a whole lot of let's make sure and, and make sure that she truly understands what this means. Mm -hmm. This was also a time where church was church, home was home and school was school. Mm -hmm. There wasn't family discipleship happening within my home. And my parents loved me, but there wasn't a whole lot of spiritual development happening at home mm -hmm. either. Um, nothing was integrated. Uh, it was also compartmentalized. Yeah. Um, now, you've been at Scotts Hill longer than I have. Mm -hmm. You said seven years on staff and then yeah. 10 years um, as, a, as a congregant, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Um, what, is something, like, what are some changes you've seen in the span of time that you've even been here? Yeah. I think um, I've noticed a lot of change and a lot of change for the good at Scotts Hill, I think. I think sometimes when we talk about change, it's always negative, like, oh, we've really gone in a bad way. But I think in this regard, we have really been focusing on this, you know, as a staff for sure, for many years. Um, when I first really started considering it on staff, I noticed that both in children's ministry and student ministry, maybe those seven to 10 years ago, there was a lot of professions of faith. Um, there were a lot of baptisms of children, of teenagers, um, and it was an exciting time to be sure. Mm -hmm. But what I found in the conversations I've had with other pastors, many of those children, many of those teens who are now young adults, they've walked away from the faith. Mm -hmm. they, they have not continued with the faith they professed. Um, and I think that's very telling. And obviously we can't let that make us totally cynical um, because God does do great works in youth. Um, but I think more or less, we as a staff and as discipleship leaders were almost playing into this emotional hype mm. that we were increasing the emotional music and kind of, you know, pressuring kids and teens into making this quick decision instead of walking with them and teaching them mm -hmm. and discipling them and taking the longer route. Mm -hmm. um, so I've seen that change, and I think that's been a good change um, in children's ministry. I've seen that very firsthand. Um, and, and along with that, you know, you had mentioned parents and discipleship at home, which is such a big focus for us. That's another shift I've seen mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first came here, um, it was very much a drop-off culture. Yep. It was very much a, 
we're going to take you to the professionals, right? So parents did not feel equipped or did not feel ready to have those, those spiritual conversations. So almost like going to the doctor, we're going to drop you off at the professional and then we hope you get what you need mm-hmm. type of situation. But really in the last, since COVID, I think that was really the impetus to get things moving. I think that families have more or less taken it on themselves through our pushing and our encouragement as well that, yeah, they are the primary spiritual leaders in their, in their children's life. So I've seen that outcome and, and less of a drop-off culture and more of a participation in Faith Walk. Yeah, I even think back to before I was on staff because I attended here a couple years, two or three years before I came on staff. And I even remember me admittedly kind of having that mentality because that was the culture Mm -hmm. of the church. It's kids ministry is kids ministry. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to where the grownups go. And there's not really a blending of the two. Mm -hmm. Um, So I've even seen that shift in the shorter amount of time that I've been here. And it makes me think of the charge in Deuteronomy 6. Like, it's, it's throughout life, like we're mm-hmm. doing life together. Ministry is not you in your corner and you in your corner. It's, mm-hmm. it's everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically the parents though, as you walk by the way, you put it on your doorpost. Mm-hmm. It's a part of your life. Yes. Um, which leads me to the next thing. I wasn't on staff very long. This was something that uh, was kind of dreamed up and kind of formulated something called Faith Steps. Yes. And this kind of goes into what you were saying, a misunderstanding between there's two specific steps that people tend to kind of confuse. Mm -hmm. And it's the faith questions and faith commitment. So could you kind of talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So basically the first thing I'll say is there's no illustration or picture that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we don't want to oversimplify something that's extremely complex in a child's life and heart. However, it is helpful to put a picture to something, you know, for us. Mm -hmm. So something we did years ago is we worked together as a staff, as really a family ministry. um, And we talked about faith steps. Um, Some of those steps are very outward and we see them happening with our eyes, like a parent-child dedication um, or a baptism. But two of those that have been very misunderstood are the, uh, the faith question step and the faith commitment. Faith questions are really what most... Most children sit in that for a long time. Teenagers are often in that. Adults are often in that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And oftentimes that's confused for a faith commitment. Um, And it's again, like I started from a parent's desire and hope that, oh, they said something about Jesus, they're saved. Oh, they said Jesus died on the cross. Ooh, cool, they're saved. But that's that's not a heart level commitment necessarily. Mm. I think what I don't want to happen is I don't want to discourage parents into saying, oh, they didn't commit, so it doesn't matter. Let's not talk about this. No, you fuel the flame of those questions. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you've had preschoolers in the recent past. I think that's when those questions really start to blossom and Mm -hmm. bloom. They're asking you out the nose, like so many different questions, good biblical, you know, starter questions, some rando questions. We've got to have them all. (laughs) Um, But I think more or less, we cultivate and we celebrate the faith questions. When it, the discernible difference is hard when it starts to become a commitment. And that's mm-hmm. that heart level surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. Yeah. A recognition of personal sin and accountability to God, which unless a child understands what sin is and how it affects them and how it distances them from God, they won't be able to get to that step. Mm. And so I think parents need to be very discerning to cultivate the questions, to answer the questions, but to recognize the difference. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And I think with my kids specifically, and we said it earlier, you said it earlier, every follower of Jesus wants their children to be saved. Yes. You want that for your kids because you know how much better life is. Um, And I even feel an unnecessary pressure as a staff member Mm. that, if I'm what's viewed as a professional, which I'm not, um, my kids are not saved. My kids are just as lost as everybody else's yeah. kids. My kids are just as dead in their trespasses. Their hearts are just as hard. Um, and they're in need of the same Savior, which is not me, as their parent. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I think about a couple examples. Uh, my oldest being eight, he's always been my deep thinker. He's the one that asks me questions that I tend to have to say, you know what, that's a, that's a really good question. What do you think? Because in the moment, I don't even have the answer. Um, but he is the one who also will say, what do I have to do? And we'll pray and, and we'll talk about it. And But we've prayed multiple times mm -hmm. together. Um, he's repeat after me. He's sometimes initiated. Um, but every time he asks me to pray, we pray together. And we've mm -hmm. talked about this before. Yeah. Um, we pray together because one of those times it's going to stick. Yes. But as of right now, there's not a discernible fruit that is constant. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think he's at that point yet, but he's very close. Mm -hmm. um, and the length of the steps, kind of like you said, is so different for every person. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you even sent me a photo of him sitting in service this past Sunday <laughs> oh, with me. his small group leader. Yeah. And I don't want to ruin like the shot we have going on, but it was, it was, it was this, <laughs> it was like this, but he was there and he was hearing, yeah, yeah. he was hearing the word and, um, yeah. you know, that's what we want. That's what we want. Yeah. Now, when I think about my younger one, mm -hmm. who is a recent six, he's a very different child than yeah. my older one. And as parents, we have the tendency to uh, compare them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have the tendency to compare their progress. Um, so he doesn't ask as many questions as his brother, but I will tell you, he's the first to want to pray. He's the first to want to help a friend in need. Mm -hmm. So while he's not asking the same deep level questions, mm -hmm. I'm seeing things in him and I'm seeing growth and maturity in him. So it's just a great example of how every kid, every person is so different. Mm -hmm. And like you said, the faith steps model is not a one size fits all right. because everybody's road to justification is different lengths mm -hmm. and has different detours. Mm -hmm. um, so you, I know this because we work all in the same office. You've mm -hmm. had many meetings with yes. children. Yes. Um, but what's interesting is that those meetings have kind of shifted in purpose. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. started as baptism meetings have kind of yeah. shifted into something else. So yeah. would you share some of that? Yeah. So I was kind of thrown into this in the beginning when I was first learning from other people how to meet with children and how to speak to them. And it was very formative. But what I noticed is, is that a lot was assumed. Um, a lot was assumed of children, whether they were six or whether they were 11, that's kind of the span of ages that I mm -hmm. meet with typically. Um, and it was the assumption that this is a done deal. They're saved and I just need to get them on the schedule and check a box. Um, so I think when I initially started these meetings, that was my mentality, but it quickly was very disillusioning because I thought, wait, they can't even describe the gospel. Mm -hmm. They can't. Um, they don't have a personal understanding of their sin. They don't know that baptism isn't necessary for salvation. Mm. It's, a, it's a working out of salvation later as a first act of obedience. So there were so many key gospel elements that you know, a six or seven or eight-year-old couldn't describe even in their own language, because I know there's a difference. I'm not expecting a 50-year-old uh, you know, answer from a six-year-old. But there was just a, a, a misunderstanding of the gospel and what it means to a child. And so I think for me, the first change that happened was I stopped considering these as baptism meetings and more as spiritual growth meetings mm. and just an opportunity to talk with a child for an hour and get to know them um, and get to understand what is your understanding of the gospel? Who is Jesus to you? What are you enjoying about church? Uh, what are you learning in your small group right now? Who are you friends with and what are they teaching you? So many life connections that is just going to paint a picture of who knows this child and, and their growth mm -hmm. and who can I ask and kind of building that network. Um, and so, discerning like what their motivation might be to even want to meet yes, with you. That is so important. And so, you know, ironically, I, I think I was nervous at first that parents would be hesitant or upset that I would push back a little bit, but more or less parents have been so understanding and thankful mm -hmm. that I pumped the brakes for them a little bit. Um, because I think in most of their spirits, there was a hesitancy and they were looking for me as a professional to kind of soothe their conscience and give them the next step. But when I come to them and say, wow, they're learning so much 
let's keep learning. Yeah. Let's not step into this big moment of baptism yet until you're sure that you've seen this fruit in their life over time. Yeah. And so it's been a really good thing. There's only been a couple scenarios where that's been a more difficult So I was going to ask, have you, since you made that shift, you know, we're, again, it all comes back to kind of the way we were raised 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. If a child was six, seven, eight, and saying, hey, I want to be baptized, they would have been pushed to the baptismal, which is similar to what happened to you and I. Not a lot of questions asked. But to slow it down, have you had to have difficult conversations um, on expectations of those meetings? Yes, I've had I've had a couple, and they've ended up being kind of comical over time. And and me and the parent have laughed about it and been able to work through it. But I think, again, a lot of it is expectations that are unstated or mm-hmm. past, you know, desires of the parent. Or, or, and I'll speak to some of that in a minute. But, um, yeah, I have had some funny moments and some tense moments um, as I've had to be very clear about what I think is right, you know, in this context as they bring the children to me. Um, and so my, my greatest desire is to have children confident of where they stand Hmm. Um, because by nature children aren't confident they're very unsure Hmm. and so I think that could be a that's a fruit of the spirit really to see that confidence and that sureness in who they are and their identity in a six-year-old way Um, but some of the things that I do just to give people kind of an insight if I'm meeting with a child and I'm kind of discerning that wow they are you know leaning towards salvation if, if they haven't truly given their lives to Christ, we walk through um, who Jesus is and we talk about uh, the Romans road. We talk about what it means to turn away from their sin and to turn towards Jesus, what it means for their sins to be taken away. You know, we talk about all those things. Um, And then if, and then if it is time for baptism, which is super exciting, Mm -hmm. uh, we walk through um, the meaning of baptism and where it's talked about in scripture, you know, we, we turn to Jesus's baptism as a model um, where the whole Trinity is present there and that Jesus is, is affirmed as God's child, just like someone being baptized is affirmed as God's child. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite passages to turn to with them is Romans 6, um, being you know, the symbolism of death to life, mm-hmm. being buried in the water and raised up again. Yeah. Um, so those are some passages I go through. And then after, you know, we, we say, yes, you believe in Jesus, you know, you're going to be baptized. We want them to be able to communicate mm-hmm. their transformation story. So their testimony. And again, this isn't going to be a crazy testimony of someone 18, 19, 20 years old. Yeah. This may just be, I used to be mad all the time at my mom, but now I have a love for my mom that I've never had before. Mm-hmm. It can be as simple as that. Yeah. And that is a fruit of the spirit. Yeah. And so we want children to be able to, in their own words, describe who they were before they really committed to Jesus. What did Jesus do? And then who are they now? Who are they becoming now? Um, th- that's what we want kids to be able to write. And that takes some time because mm-hmm. kids aren't natural writers to begin with. So being able to frame that and to share that um, publicly mm-hmm. is a thing that maybe causes nervousness. And so that's kind of the steps that I take in all those different scenarios. There are some some key things that we talk about all the time that we want to challenge parents to think differently Mm -hmm. than the way we kind of grew up as kids. And there were some key statements or key kind of ideas that you kind of hit on in all of that. But if you had to summarize in just a couple bullet points, what would you say? Yeah. So as I was thinking about this, you know, challenging parents, the first thing that I know you speak to all the time as well, and it's this is not a race. Mm. Um, I actually had a conversation one time with a with a family member and they were convinced that because their child was eight, it was time for them to be baptized. And I said to them, what's the rush? Like, why are, why are we rushing through this when there's uncertainty everywhere with the child, with the parent, with me? Um, th- this is not a race. Better for it to be a slower approach and a truer approach than to rush through and have disillusionment, mm. you know, like our stories for a bit and for so many that are now as a college student or beyond thinking, wait, do I need to be baptized again? Was that real? So those are just things that I'm passionate about. So this is not a race. Another thing is, and I mentioned this a little bit too, don't try to live through your child. Mm. Um, That's so hard, I think, especially (laughs) if it was a rough spiritual beginning for the parent. 
and they see good, good things happening in their child's life, they want to just relish that and they want to live vicariously through their child. But don't, mm. don't do that. Let your child live his or her life. Encourage them, but don't take that on yourself. Um, the, the other one, which is so hard to hear, is release control. That's one of the hardest things, right? That's shudders from all parents. So sure. hard. Um, but releasing control, that's what makes this so difficult, is that you cannot control your child's salvation. You cannot force it. You cannot cause it. That is only caused by God alone. You can only uh, be a model in that sense. And so release control and then do what you can do. Uh, model, teach, correct, affirm, all of those positive actions. Definitely do those, but with an understanding that ultimately it's not up to you. Yeah. Yeah. Releasing control is really hard in every aspect of life. Mm. Amen. <laughs> but it's also a relief at the same time that it's mm. not on us because as parents, no matter what we do, God is infinitely more wise and infinitely more powerful, and mm. He's gonna He's gonna see His will through. Yes. Um, when you, I've heard that I can't take credit for this, <laughs> but I don't know where I've heard it. Um, I have I heard at one point. I really don't think I was creative enough to come up with it myself. But um, when when you're approaching spiritual development for your child, it take a crock pot acro- approach. So mm-hmm. like when you think about a microwave versus a crock pot, a crock pot, it's slow. Mm-hmm. It takes a long time. It's going to simmer. But it's going to yield a, a meal that is extremely flavorful and mm-hmm. memorable mm-hmm. Um, and delicious. Mm-hmm. Microwave tends to yield results that are rushed, quick. They don't typically taste as good. They're not as good of a quality of food. Mm -hmm. And if you take that approach and you rush your child to the baptistry or if you're rushing them through before they're truly ready, Mm -hmm. then there's going to be some regret and resentment for the push from the parent, but also as an like me as a grown woman looking back and thinking, I was not ready for that. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready for that. And I think oftentimes children and adults alike have this misunderstanding that there has to be some monumental Mm -hmm. exact moment. I remember what I was wearing, where I was sitting, and it was so emotional. And for some people, Mm -hmm. that's true. But for some people, it's just a slow burn. Mm -hmm. And no matter what experience you have as a believer, you hit on this earlier, the way to discern is if there is a before Christ you and there's a with Christ you. Mm -hmm. You might not be able to remember exactly what happened in the senses that you experienced, but you are exhibiting fruit that is so different than before you were with Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's so neat, and we've read a book on this, where the Holy Spirit will oftentimes take things before we were saved, and mm-hmm. He will refine them, and you'll still have the same gifting, but it will actually be used for the kingdom. Mm-hmm. It's almost like you have a renewed sense of a skill or a renewed purpose for some sort of gift that you have. You know, and I think one thing Um, that I have learned in education, but especially in ministry when you're dealing with children and spiritual growth, um, is children are not truly able to think abstractly Mm, until, you know, 10, 11, 12. Their brains have not matured enough Mm -hmm. to be able to think outside of what is right in front of me. So to expect a child to be able to submit to a supernatural act, Mm -hmm. because that's what it is, of salvation, Right it's almost unreasonable to put that expectation on them Mm -hmm. at the age of four and five and six when our goal then is to just train them and to educate them and to help them know that God loves them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for them, a child of that age, to understand that I am separated because of my sin Mm -hmm. and to be able to take ownership of that Mm -hmm. is not something that's very common. Not saying that the Lord is not able to save kids at three and Mm -hmm. four and five and praise God, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. But it's extremely rare. It is. And I think we parents put this unnecessary pressure Mm -hmm. and the culture puts pressure on them like to get older faster. And we see that in the media and we see all the pressures of school Mm -hmm. and the stakes are a lot higher. And I think sometimes that bleeds into 
our discipleship of them and we expect them because they're able mm -hmm. to handle more mm -hmm. that they're going to be able to understand salvation at yeah. a younger age and that's just not the way we're set up right um so that leads me uh, to ask, you have met with children, we've talked about your meetings with children, you really get kind of a, a um, frontline view mm -hmm. to the questions they ask, and mm -hmm. what are some of the biggest misconceptions that children have, and maybe yeah. even adults have yeah. about specifically baptism? Right. Yeah, no, that's good. And I think, again, it's important that you said this is not just children's misconceptions, it's parents too. Um, that I've noticed. And just going off what you just said, I think the strict timeline is, is an important one to hit on again. Um, because again, some parents come in with this desire of, this happened in my life when I was eight, so it needs to be when they're eight. And they carry that through, or they have this fatalistic thing of, if it doesn't happen by eight, it won't happen. Or, mm. you know, there's all these types of notions that are going on. Um, so I think a strict timeline can be a hindrance. Now, Caveat, I will say this, because this, this could be a good biblical argument. Well, what about the story of the Ethiopian eunuch? Um, and the whole point of that in Acts mm. chapter 8 is, if a person believes, don't wait. Like, get them baptized. It needs baptized. to be immediate. Right. Sure. But I think, again, the discernment is not saving, are they saved and then into baptism? It's, are they saved at all? Period. Period. Question. That's yeah. the question. Yeah. If, if we can discern without a shadow of a doubt that a person is saved, then yeah, let's do everything we can to get them baptized quickly. Mm -hmm. So that's just something that I, I thought about. Um, so I think the timeline can be, can be hard for people. Um, I think um, another thing I think of is baptism being a saving act. I had mentioned that a little bit earlier, and that's one of my favorite questions to ask a child. Hot take. Hot take. But baptism really. doesn't save no, you. No, it doesn't. Um, but kids, for whatever reason, because it's an external thing, mm -hmm. I think they grab onto it. Yep. And all of our sinful tendencies to do something in order to be accepted and saved. Um, I think they see that and I ask, hey, Sally, um, do you need to get baptized in order to be saved? And some of them are like, uh-huh. And I say, no, <laughs> that's, that's not right. <laughs> the Bible says that that's something we do after we're mm -hmm. saved as a demonstration of our faith and our obedience to show we're part of the family of God. Mm -hmm. Now, many children who have parents that I know have taught them, you know, in that, they come, they say, no, it's just something to show the body of Christ that, that I'm a part of the family. So I think that's something I've seen a lot is just a misunderstanding of, the purpose and the mm. place of baptism. Mm -hmm. That baptism, and some adults don't even understand this, that baptism is not something that saves, it's something that demonstrates a previous work of salvation in your heart. Um, then another one that touches on what you were talking about is, oh, the beloved age of accountability. Ooh. Shudders when I think about that question. And yes. as a children's it's pastor, controversial now. this has kept me up at night, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. um, but it was this past year I listened to a sermon that really helped me understand this. Um, this can be a hindrance because I think I can discount and I admit sometimes for young children, well, you know, they can't understand this or maybe they're not at the place where God holds them accountable, but there's just no easy scripture to turn to necessarily for this. However, I was listening to something in, in the verse Isaiah 715, which seems so random, but stick with me. It's the Christmas chapter, right? Where mm -hmm. the wonderful counselor, all of that, that prophecy, of peace, all, the all the things. And 715 says that this child will at some point be able to reject what is bad and choose what is good. Mm -hmm. And that reality of being able to consciously reject bad and choose good that is the age of accountability. And maybe age is a misnomer, like that may not happen at a certain age. Some children are able to reject what is bad and choose what is good at four. Mm -hmm. Some, not till they're nine or 10, do they really understand that reality. And then you bring in the whole idea of special needs or people don't, that have mental deficits sure. um, that are not able to consciously make that determination or that interchange between bad and good, good and evil, like that's important. Mm -hmm. In, unless someone can consciously choose, then God does not hold them accountable. Um, and that's a whole nother conversation. Mm -hmm. But I think that's important as well, that we're very conscious of that with your with your nursery child, you know, with your one, two, three, four, five-year-old even maybe is God holds them in his arms 
until the point that they can make that choice. Mm -hmm. And so parents need to be ready and know, okay, they're entering the season of accountability where they can really decide what's good and evil. So that's when God will hold them accountable um, for their salvation. And I think sometimes we have a hard time with that as parents and even just adults because we want so badly for them to recognize their sin. And we want them to recognize that life is so much better with yeah. Christ. Um, but I think sometimes we try to take control and we try to play God ourselves because we don't have an understanding mm. and a true trust mm. in God himself. Yeah. Like we don't understand that he is, he has a sovereign plan right. and that he is over all things. And then if we understand that he is good, then his process and his will is on him and it's not on us. We are not called to save, mm -hmm. he is. We are called to be faithful. Yeah. And I think that release of control, oftentimes when I tend to release control in parenting, in my marriage, in anything, it's when he does his most work, when I get out of the way. Yeah. So I think that's just encouraging um, for parents to remember that it's not all on us. Yeah, and I wanna hear from you more in just a second about, you know, we've talked about what we can't do, but I think it's important for parents to learn and remember what they can do. Before we get there, I had to throw in one other one. One other one. Other, one other misconception okay. that maybe some even adults, and I've had to learn this myself, even as church staff and pastor, the connection that we make between baptism and church membership yes. can't be understated. Mm -mm. Um, and for children, that's something that, that takes a little bit of work to explain to them when they are baptized, we want them to be baptized into a faith family. That's why our church holds that position that, you know, we baptize, number one, with pastors. Um, you know, I always tell children, why don't you just get baptized at home with mom and dad in the bathtub? And they <laughs> laugh at that. And I said, it's because that's not showing to the church, your faith family, your participation with us mm -hmm. and that you have brothers and sisters here. And so I think there's a misunderstanding that this is more than just an act that you do that goes on a certificate that you put on your wall. This is you are born into a family, essentially, and you mm -hmm. have an obligation. Even as a child, you have an obligation to your classmates here at church, um, to your leader, to your teachers here. You have an obligation, you have a relationship, your brothers and sisters. Um, and so I think that is something that for adults takes a while to really churn, but with kids, that's something that we have to talk about as well, that yeah. relationship. Yeah, I think that's good. And it just changes your view on other people. Mm -hmm. You view other people differently because the relationship has shifted. They're mm -hmm. part of your family now. Um, yeah, I... To get back to what you said, I think we've talked about what we can't control and that can be kind of scary, but there are things we can control. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think there's a, a common, it's not a proverb, I don't think it is, uh, but there's that phrase that we hear, I've heard often where it's more is caught than taught. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't see it, I mean, you see it so clearly when Jesus is teaching his disciples, they're on the go. It's a part of their life. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a ton of like, sit down, let me have a small group discussion on what we're about to do. It was yeah. like, we're going and we're doing, and mm -hmm. I'm gonna bring you into, in, into this mission. Um, so as parents, we are called to shepherd our kids. And our job is to bring them in with us and let them observe what it means to be a believer, to be a follower of Christ, to mm -hmm. be dedicated and disciplined in reading his word and in prayer. Um, so they're often watching us. Actually, they're not often, they're always watching us and they're assessing how does mom react when we pull up to a stoplight and there is someone standing on the side of the road mm. with a sign that's homeless? It's good. Um, how does dad react when a full glass of milk is spilt on the counter in the midst of trying to get God out of the it. house and go to school? Yeah. Um, do, do my parents allow me to play a sport on a Sunday morning instead Ooh. of going to church, which is a whole different podcast, but I have a lot of thoughts on it. <laughs> Watch um, out now. <laughs> but I mean, what, what are we doing and what does that communicate to our kids? Because they're going to do what we do. They're mm -hmm. gonna do what we do. They are looking to emulate people around them. And if I am, I am living in their house, yep. I want them to emulate me. I don't want them to emulate people who are not following the Lord. Um, 
I, I often will assess when things are going good, mm -hmm. who am I praising? Mm. Am I praising with them? Am I saying, hey, mom had something really awesome happen at work today. I am so thankful that God put me in the position mm. that I'm in. Or am I saying, you know what, I'm so lucky. Or, yeah, words matter. yeah they do. Or when things are really hard, mm -hmm. I'm lamenting, or there's some sort of grief, or I'm angry. Right. How am I reacting? Am I shifting blame? Mm -hmm. Am I taking accountability? Right. Um, what if I sin against them? I'm home with them all day. I've I've attempted to have a break in the bathroom at some point, but they're <laughs> banging luck. on the door, <laughs> and I'm at my wit's end, and I lose my temper and I yell. Do I am I humble enough to go to them and say? Mommy sinned against you, mm -hmm. and I'm really sorry that I raised my voice. Will you please forgive me? Am I mm -hmm. humble enough to ask them for forgiveness? So I think they're constantly assessing me, and they're mm -hmm. watching me. And I don't say all that to say that you're going to get it right a thousand percent of the time because right. you won't. But I think it's owning mistakes, and mm -hmm. I think it's giving glory to where glory um, is due. And I think it's important to remember that there's no recipe for a child's salvation. There's mm, not like good. put in a little bit of love and a little bit of prayer and yeah. uh, family discipleship time that lasts an hour, and then poof, they're going to be saved. Yeah. We trust that we serve a God who can do above and beyond all that mm -hmm. we ask or think. Mm -hmm. And we trust that God is going to do um, a mighty a mighty work mm -hmm. in them. So some practical things um, yeah. would be read your Bible in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, invite their questions. I think we hit faith questions, but we're sometimes as parents scared of their questions for two reasons. <laughs> Number one, we might not know the answer. Right. And that's scary because sometimes it makes us feel like we're inadequate. So we give them to the professionals, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, or when they're questioning God, we're like, no, you can't question him. Right. But if you read the Psalms, they ask him questions constantly. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. wants He's us to- He's big enough for their he questions. He is, he wants them to ask questions. He wants us to ask questions because when we ask questions, we're wrestling mm -hmm. and we're making faith ours. Yes. So when they're asking questions, like how, I remember Noah asked me one time, how does our money get to heaven? When we tithe, like <laughs> how does, how so does God get so the money? Literal. And I said, well, no, what do you think? And he said, well, I think if we take like a leaf blower and we blow it up, that it will maybe get to him. And in the mind of a four-year-old, like he's trying to make sense of it, but it led to, I'm like, you know what, buddy, that's a really cool idea. But actually this is how the church uses our money. And it le it leads to great conversations. Mm -hmm. And some of those questions get really, really hard. Mm -hmm. um, but there's grace in that. And um, it's it's constantly asking for forgiveness, evaluating your disciplines. Am I leading them well? Would yeah. I want them to copy me? Um, if the answer is no, then you have serious self-reflection. If the answer is yes, then you keep fighting yes. um, the good fight. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that we're getting close to our time yep. together. Um, we have a few recommended resources. I know that have been a blessing to me mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're going to be dropped at the bottom of the, the video. The video. Mm -hmm. We'll kind of attach, we'll attach those. Yeah. Um, but was there any kind of final things to wrap this up? Yeah. Well, I, and just addressing those listening. Thank you. Thank you for bearing with us. This has been a long conversation, um, but truly our hearts are for you. Um, and our hearts are for your children. You know, coming from someone, I, I don't have children yet. So I really, it, it's so wonderful to be able to love on your kids and disciple your kids along with you. Um, and I think that we just want you to leave encouraged from this conversation that you have the most important job in the world, mm -hmm. but you have a God that has all power and all ability and all goodness and all love for you and for your children. Um, I just am so reminded that Jesus loves and cares for children. Um, and so be encouraged by that, that um, you have been hand selected mm -hmm. by the sovereign God of the universe to parent your children in this season. And so we love you. Uh, we just pray that you run the race set before you with joy. 
Um, but not compete against other people. No, <laughs> no. Just run and just look straight ahead. Don't be looking to the side, to the right or to the left. Yep. Um, faithfully build your life on the rock of Christ. When the storms come, you're going to be firm and you're mm. going to be steady. Um, so thank you for listening in. Again, uh, we'd love your feedback if this is helpful to you or if there's other things in the future that you would love for us to discuss with you. Um, we'd love to do that. So uh, we hope to see you soon.